Good morning. I thought I would bring you a new book talk today. Uh, this is on the book uh, Dark Life by Cat Falls. She was one of our guest authors at our middle school a few years ago. Uh, she and it was this book was also featured on the Illinois Reads list. Um, Cat actually signed this particular one. This is one out of my personal collection. So she writes on there. Um, to Christy, I'd love to hear your read aloud voices. So um, evidently, my my ability to do read alouds is <laughs> was able to get to her. Anyways, um, so I chose this book to to do a book talk on because there are a lot of students who who do like realistic fiction, um, but there are another group that like the sci-fi, and I happen to um, think that these are a good way to escape our current situation, you know, transport yourself to a different place instead of uh, being reminded of what is going on right now. So, um, this particular book is about, um, it's futuristic, and uh, it's when our country has come to the time where we no longer have anywhere to build um, houses or cities. We've run out of property and land. And so now we're building communities under the water. And our main uh, character, Ty, is um, a boy that is, uh, he has, um, his family owns property under uh, in the ocean. And he was born there. And they find out that uh, he has uh, special abilities. And so he doesn't want anyone to know this because he doesn't want to become like a social experiment and have to go and live in the lab and have them poke and prod him. So he's not he's not too interested in letting people know this information. So um, I wanted to read a little bit of chapter one to you. Um, so in the part that I'm going to begin reading, he is um, in the water and he's exploring. He's not supposed to do that. He's on his mana board, which is kind of like a flotation device that he can he can um, get around. And then um, he also uh, is exploring areas by himself. He's not supposed to do that. And so, while he's down there in the in the deep, um, our author Cat kind of describes some of the the fish life and some of the crevasses that are there and he comes across this abandoned submarine and so he decides to of course go and check it out and so while he's in there he realizes that um, something terrible has happened uh, there's blood everywhere and things are like kind of torn out of the um, electrical panels and there's a bunch of weapons that are missing and so he realizes something terrible has has uh, has happened so while he's down there he meets another character that we uh, get introduced to her name is Gemma and Gemma is a girl and she's what we know as known as the topsider she lives above ground he knows this because you can tell her hair coloring she's got freckles um, she's obviously been exposed to the skin um, the Sun anyways uh, he can tell by her skin because she was exposed to the Sun and so she knows that he is not necessarily normal because he's kind of got this glow about him and then he says it's because of the food he eats so that's kind of interesting anyways um, so where we're, where we are reading now we're picking up is um, they're having this conversation about living under the water and whatever and uh, let me take a drink of my coffee real quick and uh, they start hearing this noise outside of of the sh of the submarine because they're both inside they're both checking it out they didn't know that they were in they were both inside there so um, so he finds her and she's startled and they have that conversation about where they live and and whatever and now they're kind of freaking out because there's a some of the strange noises that they hear so that's where we're gonna pick up so a shrill clicking vibrated vibrated through the hall our eyes door darted towards the ceiling and then there was this icky inky water outside of the viewing dome growing louder and faster the clicking turned into a piercing trill then something crashed against the curved window with a shriek, Gemma threw her arms over her head until the flexi glass didn't shatter. 
Instead, a dark object bumped down on the window, trailing with a thick chain. It's a tow hook. I shut off my flashlight, and then I pushed past her to peer through the dome. You need to kill your light. Above us, a sub hovered with its exterior lights glowing softly, outlining its shape, a shape I had heard described many times, always in fearful tones. The heavy hook hit the rig's bumper with a thud and reverberated through the soles of my boots and up my spine, and I backed away. We need to get out of here. The path of light shone down through the darkness. Come on, I urged, but Gemma's gaze just stayed. Gemma's gaze just stayed on the outside. Now taut, this chain was writhing in the spotlight beam. That's, that's a specter up there, I ex tried to explain. And it belongs to a pair of boots thunked against the viewing dome and kicked off again. The rest of the man shimmied into view. When he let go of the chain and dropped onto the bumper, a second man slid down after him. Now, Gemma skittered back into the shadows. Who are they? She said quietly. I crouched as the thin beams of light crisscrossed the bridge, coming from the man's helmets. They're outlaws, I whispered, tugging her down. Really? She looked outside with a new interest as the outlaws attached the tow hook to the rig. With every move they made, their crown lights bounced wildly inside the bridge. Then I touched my thigh where there were several inches of serrated steel was holstered. Still, as skilled as I was with a knife and a spear gun, I knew I would not be able to fend off a sub full of grown men. We had to get out of this rig unnoticed. I nudged Gemma and pointed to the corridor. The last look at the outlaws she followed me into the dark hall, and in the gear room, I flicked on my flashlight and stepped through the hatchway. She didn't budge from the threshold. Does this mean that that is not fish blood? I don't know, I admitted. Until now, there had only been proof that the sleep like gang had ever killed anyone but just a heap of ugly stories and a bullet in a skipper's leg. Although, to convince me, I didn't want to tangle with an outlaw. Around us, the hall moaned and creaked. Hurry! I circled the room to avoid the blood. Once they haul this wreck out of the mud, it's going to fly. I'm not going outside, she hovered in the corridor. I'll hide somewhere in here. Maybe I shouldn't have told her all about those giant squids. Listen, I said. If the sea plague -like gang killed somebody in here, with a shudder and the sub lurched forward, I grabbed onto the air lock's hatch frame to keep it from falling over. You can bet. They're going to be dumping this rig right over the cold slept canyon. Do you want to go down with it? Blanching, she dashed to the airlock. Tell me again why people live down here, she said. I hit the button that closed the hatch behind her. When you are in, you need to suck it in all the way, all the way. And then she flushed uh, pink. I excuse me? The liquid gin. You have to suck it in all the way. Flipping her helmet over her head and slapped its seal shut. Sometimes beginners leave pockets of air in their lungs. Then, when they get it into the black, their chest is smashed flat by the air pressure. And then I clapped my hands together for effect. The icy glare that she shot me could have restored the glaciers. But my words must have sunk in because she bit down on the liquid gin tube at the base of her helmet and made every effort to fill her lungs. As she gagged and snorted, she fell against the chamber wall, setting off a blinking red light from the exterior hatch. I secured my own helmet, only to realize with a jolt that Gemma couldn't have set off the light. The light only pulsed when someone outside pushed the entry button. I snapped off my flashlight, and then not in a second or two soon, the hatch dialed open and a stream of water shot into the airlock glistening like blood spurt in the pulsating red light. A stream widened into the waterfall and then churned water climbed over our bodies and unspooled a short length of a ripcord from my belt, clipped it to the end of Gemma's belt, and then steered her to the wall near the open hatch. As soon as the ocean filled in the chamber, a beam of light cut through the bubbles, a helmet light, and I waited. I waited with nerves flaring. 
the dark figure stepped through the hatch, and in an instant he crossed the chamber. I darted outside, dragging Gemma with me. Given our speed, he must have felt the water ripple behind him. He wheeled around, looking younger than I expected, or maybe he would just seem as if his mouth was hanging open and his dark eyes wide were seeing the two of us. In a burst of movement, he slashed forward, daring to bar his teeth that were filled into points of bleach till they were transparent as the dragonfish fangs. Thrusting Gemma behind me, I slammed the entry button. As the hatch clinched shut, the outlaw threw out a hand, grabbing for my neck. The metal plates closed around his forearm. His fingers raked my chest, not trying to snag me anymore, but convulsing under the pressure. Stambling back, I banged into Gemma and knocked her off the bumper into the gloom. The ripcord between us snapped taut and then yanked me into the darkness after her. For an instant, I sprawled into the ooze, my legs entwined with hers. Then we were barrel rolling into the rig, taking Gemma with me. A second later, the sub lifted off the seafloor, kicking up, split as it went, uh, silt as it went, sailing into the darkness. I got to my feet, only to tremble backwards into the mud when Gemma grabbed me onto my, grabbed onto my dive belt. Did she think that I was going to leave her? The ripcord had been linked to us. As we got up together, she gripped my hand like a manta ray, chomping prey. I suppose that the freezing darkness and the intense pressure could be nerve-wracking if you weren't used to it, which was why the other settlers had almost never left the continental shelf. They didn't share my fascination with the Cold Sleep Canyon, even though it was longer and deeper than the Grand Canyon and a hundred times creepier. Cold Sleep had been named for the Hudson Canyon until a chunk of the East Coast had slid into its gaping, gaping side. Now everyone associated with this chasm of death and destruction, I just associated it now with just predators. I checked around us for the Green Lantern sharks. sharks. Seeing none, I turned on my crown lights and dim and located my mana board. Gemma matched my step for step with her lights blazing and the knife was out. A glare would attract every beast in the area and her knife wouldn't stop half of them, but it was weaving in and out and making me feel a little better, I guess. Luckily, her needle nose vehicle was whirling in a brine pool about a hundred yards away. A wealthy topsider toy. A real beauty. I held the anchor chain taut so she could shimmy up it to the gel-filled ring as an entry port. I followed Pausing, pausing to hitch my mana to the jet's tail, where it hovered, resembling a real mana ray, minus its tail. I wriggled inside and spilled into the pilot bench beside her. It was a little settling as it was small, but it was a perfect rocket. After unsealing my helmet, I drew in a breath to make the liquigen in my lungs evaporate. Because we had filled our lungs with liquid and not some mix of gases, our chances of getting the bends were slim. Still, I was glad to see that Gemma had turned her vehicle depressurization system. Besides me, she was coughing up liquigen. Don't hack it out, I instructed, stowing our helmets behind the seat. That's harder on your lungs. She swallowed, her eyes were watering. You know, this isn't really a mini-sub, right? My fingers were whispering over the control panel. It's a jet fin. It's a jet fin. It's not made for deep diving. As I touched the icon, I turned on its toggle switches on the panel into holograms. The run she realized when she was staring at me. Sorry, did you want to drive? It's, it's your rental. No, no, she said as her voice was shaky. I'm sure you've been piloting subs since you were five. Well, four, really, I said with a smile, but she did not return it. Want me to take you back to the trade station? She nodded, and then her eyes were shining as a mix of alarm and fascination the way that a little sister gazed at a mammal with fur. I have to go anyway to report this rig. To avoid her stare, I searched for the switch that drew up the anchor. Nothing good were ever going to follow uh, that kind of a look. How did you find the sub in the dark, she asked. Uh, your jet fin. Many subs aren't, uh, aren't tricked out for speed. You didn't answer the question. I shrugged, though my inches, my insides whirled like a 
a comb jelly. I had spooked her, and here I thought I was acting normal. I just followed the current, I said, which was true, I mean, sort of. Any pioneer can do it. I jammed the throttle and the jet fin blustered forward, throwing us back up against the seat, and I knew Gemma was still watching me. I could feel it. I tried to focus on the throw of the ride, but even that didn't underclench my gut. It's true, isn't it? A soft instinct in her words poked at me. What they say about pioneer kids down here. Oh, they say a lot of things, and it's it's all chum. I kept my eyes on the viewpoint, and I increased the jet speeds. Um, we're just like you. No, you're not. She may as well have jabbed me with her flashlight again. In fact, I would have preferred it. Bruises went away. I turned to defend myself. But Gemma's gave was as bright and as intense as the flare that I had fired at the green lantern sharks. And like those deep sea cre creatures, I froze. Admit it, she says. You have a dark gift. Check it out. Dark Life by Cat Falls.